I want to ask you this morning to join with me in the book of Numbers, chapter 13. <clears throat> the book of Numbers, chapter 13, and I want to read verses 30 through 33. Uh, certainly, the context of the message um, uh, is going to involve the story of what has happened before uh, these verses, but this morning, we just want to read these particular verses. Numbers chapter 13, verses 30 through 33. The scripture says, <clears throat> And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once <clears throat> and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against this people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up the evil report of the land, which had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. <clears throat> and the people that we saw in, saw in it are men of great statue. <clears throat> Great statue, I'm sorry. It's kind of difficult to get my voice uh, cleared up this morning. <clears throat> Verse 33 says, And there we saw giants, the sons of Anak, which came of the giants, and were in our own, we and we in our own sight as grasshoppers, and we were as we were in their sight. Let me read that 33rd verse again. And there we saw giants, the sons of Anak, which came of the giants, and we were in our own sight as grasshoppers, and so we were in their sight. I want you to think about this morning. They are big, but not big enough. They are big, but not big enough. Without a doubt, we can recognize, all of us on here this morning, recognize that we have been through some pretty challenging and overwhelming things pretty much since the beginning of this new year. There was the, on January 6th, the insurrection there in Washington, D.C. Before then, there was the political confusion and accusations and things about our elections that take place, took place were not fair and that the election was stolen by some. And then to move from that over the past couple of weeks, more than a third of this country has been placed in weather dipping temperatures that we have never seen before. And it's been overwhelming. It's caused some anxiousness. People are wondering what's going on. People are blaming the and pointing fingers at the power companies because uh, in their mind, preparations should have been made. In other words, even the power companies were overwhelmed by something that they did not expect. And as I was sitting this past week, over this past week, and um, looking at the, out the window at the weather situation and the temperature. My wife has um, been throwing open the patio door because she likes to feed the birds that come close to the house. And she was marveling and I was marveling as well because when I was growing up, uh, the only time I saw cardinals, red birds, was in the summer and springtime. But our backyard had three or four cardinals in it, and not only cardinals, it had blue jays, and it had other birds. And I sat there and I thought to myself, look at God's hand at work. I said, look at God's hand at work because here we are, shut up in the house. The furnace is turned up high, uh, and we're sitting at a bit of, of concern, wondering if the power is going to go off. The temperature is below zero, and the windshield is, is dangerously low, but yet I'm looking out the window at some little birds who are flapping their wings and just eating the, the bread crumbs that my wife threw out the door 
and they're flying from one branch to the other and acting like it's 100 degrees outside. My mind went immediately back to Matthew, where Jesus says and challenges us and says, why do we worry and why are we anxious? Uh, in other words, a sparrow cannot fall from the air without our Heavenly Father know, uh, knowing it. And he feeds them and takes care of them and provides for them. And then the Lord asks a very uh, pointed question. In other words, I'll paraphrase it by putting it this way. If he's able to provide and take care of the birds, aren't you greater than the birds? Is not he able also to take care of you? And as you look at yourself and as I look at myself, and as we look around, we can look at ourselves having come through what we've come through by the grace and by the mercy of, all, of Almighty God. When we speak in terms then of being uh, overcome or overwhelmed, we're talking about a category many times that says that something has happened by force or by numbers that has caused a situation that we are used to to change. In other words, something has changed the operation. Something has changed the norm. And sometimes this type of a thing, just like we've come through, is really an undesirable thing. We really don't want to be here, but it's beyond our control. It's something that we don't have any power over. No matter how much we fret, no matter how much we complain, we cannot change it at all. The only thing that we can do is try to adjust. The only thing we can do is, is call upon the Lord and ask him for wisdom and direction as to how to get through this and to aid us in getting through this. In other words, it brings us to a point where we are made to recognize that what we did not want to do, we now have to do because things have drastically changed. But it doesn't take a bad weather situation to help us to see this. We can see it in our communities all over this land and country. How many times do we hear that uh, the jails are overwhelmed and, and the people who are now being, the, the, the courts are still sitting in the jail, uh, some jails don't have any place to put the people because the jails are overwhelmed. The pandemic has made things overwhelming for us. And, and certainly when people uh, are calling for help and people are needing this and people are needing that, those who are the suppliers, those who are the counselors, those who are the first responders can be sometimes become overwhelmed because the call is so great. But then there's another category that it's a matter of being overwhelmed, and that category is being completely overcome or overpowered by thought or feeling. In other words, it isn't something physical that's, that's threatening us. It isn't something physical that's taking over us. Uh, what's taking over us now is the way we think and the way we feel. So sometimes there are people who are overcome by fear. Sometimes as, uh, as a result of this fear, uh, it causes a mental anticipation. In other words, we start asking the question, what if this and what if that? What if this happens and what if that happens? And, and I don't know about you, but I'll be transparent with you. I asked that same question over this past week. Well, what if this happens and what if that happens? And calling upon the Lord for wisdom and for understanding. Because, again, my mind was taken by the Holy Spirit back to what James wrote in, James, in, in, in the book of James when he said, If any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. My mind was taken to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. that says that those that come to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So sometimes when fear sets in, it causes some anxious anxiousness. There's some mental anticipation. We ask all kind of questions of what if. Uh, it's this kind of being overwhelmed uh, that brought on the feelings and brought on the anxiousness and presents itself here in this particular passage here in the book of Numbers. Nobody surrounded the spies that Moses had sent out. Nobody had uh, was plotting and planning to attack the spies that God had sent out through Moses. Some of these spies simply allowed their minds to paint a bigger picture of trouble than what their eyes were seeing. The problem with this is the alternative picture that is painted in our minds is seldom comes to pass. In other words, I've heard someone say this once before, that 
of what we worry about never happens. It immediately begins to sap our strength. It sends us into a state of anxiousness. It locks up our faith because it creates a spiritual amnesia of what God's word has said and what God has promised. In other words, it is disastrously contagious so that not only do we go through this, but we can cause others to go through the same thing. In other words, because you're afraid, you can cause others to be afraid. Because you're anxious, you can cause others to be anxious. Because you're faithless, you can cause others' faith to be weak. And this is a dangerous and a disastrous situation. And certainly this is what happened here in this passage in Numbers as the spies came back and gave the report to Moses and to the people. Uh, we'll, we'll cross this here in, in just a little bit. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but you know the story. Two of them came back and said, yes, we can. We can take it. We are well able. But then 10 out of the 12 says, no, we can't do this. We're not equipped for this. We don't have the power. and We're unable. We're too small. We're, they make us look like grasshoppers in our own sight. So we know we look like grasshoppers in their sight. And because the 10 were anxious, because the 10 were fearful, because the 10 did not have faith and forgot what God had said, because the 10 did not realize that it, it, that it was God who brought them safe thus far, that it was God who was given them the promise and told them to march on over to the prom to be prepared, to march on over to the promised land. They forgot, and their fear not only caused them to forget what God had promised, but it upset the people, it disturbed the people, and as a result of that, the people themselves became uh, faithless and, 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 and anxious. Uh, mental illness is real, but it has been made a stigma in this time in which we live. And, and, and bear with me now because I realize that I just said something that someone is raising their eyebrows about. You're wondering, why would I bring this up? Well, hold on with me just for a little bit. Mental illness is real, but it's been made a stigma in this time in which we live. In other words, there's a, there, everybody who's mentally ill is not crazy. Uh, the, uh, mentally, Ill, the, 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 mentally ill means that there's something going on with the mind but it does not mean that you are destitute. It does not mean that you are harmed. It does not mean that you're a threat to somebody. But, but unfortunately, uh, in this day and time in which we live, we have a tendency to put labels on people who are mentally ill. We call them crazy. We call them unfit. We say the people are, uh, uh, people start looking at them all kind of funny, wondering what's going on with them. Some can't, uh, uh, be trusted, and, and, and some are, are, are labeled as criminal, criminals or poor, prone to be criminals. Some of them look at mentally ill people or people who have a mental problem and just call them fools because they don't know how to adapt or operate in everyday normal society. But now let me help you to understand something, brothers and sisters. The fact is everybody is mentally ill who does not believe in God and is not living in obedience to him. Everybody who, is not, uh, who does not believe in God and who is not living in obe obedience to him is mentally ill. In other words, the psalmist says in Psalms 14, verses 1 through 3, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. The Lord looketh down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any that did understand and seek God, and they all had gone aside. They were all, they are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. In other words, what God is looking down, when God looked down upon the earth to see if there was any that did good, to see if anybody's mind was straight, to see if anybody's mind was clear, to see if anybody's mind searched after righteousness, to see if anybody's mind was in tune to learning and loving him, he did not find not one person on the face of the earth. That's why the scripture says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So in essence, what he's saying is all are mentally ill. All are deranged. All are confused. All are, are, are don't understand which way is up. All don't understand what their need is. All think they got all things together. All of them think that they're handling this by themselves. In other words, they're, they, they are all mentally ill. In other words, you've got to be out of your mind to say that God does not exist. 
To think that you are in control, you've got to be out of your mind. To think that you can figure it out all by yourself, no matter what you're going through, you've got to be out of your mind. In other words, that's absolute craziness, which is what society wants us to believe is mental illness. If that's the case, then all of us are mentally ill in one way or another. It's just as bad not to trust the Lord. Note what the passage points out for us. It was God who sent the spies um, through Moses uh, to spy out the land. If you want to bounce up with me just for a few minutes and, and, and take a look at verses 1 and 2, you'll see that. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send men, that they may search out the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel, up to every tribe of their fathers, shall ye send a man, every one a ruler of them. It was God who was sending the spies out, but Moses was the agent through which was, com was communicating God's command. So it was God that was sending out the spies, and verses 1 and 2 identifies that. But look at the leaders that were chosen. Uh, out of every tribe, it was leaders and the rulers that were selected. Take a look with me at verse 3. Uh, and we won't read all the way through verse 16 because it really involves all of these. But take a look at verse 3. It says, And Moses, by, command, by the commandment of the Lord, sent them forth from the wilderness uh, to uh, Paran, all those whose heads, all those whose heads of the children of Israel. In other words, Moses did as the Lord commanded him to select leaders, to select rulers out of the tribes from each tribe and put these men together as a company and send them over to spy out the land. Well, this is important for us to recognize, brothers and sisters, because God specifically told Moses, pick out the leaders of the people, and I'm going to send the leaders on ahead to spy out the land. In other words, to help Moses, they were to go and look at the land so they could come back and help Moses and encourage the people with the vision that God gave them. They were to help to establish some enthusiasm in the mind of the people that said, we've been to the promised land. We've looked over into the promised land. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. The fruit in it is tremendous. And, yes, there's some people there, but we are well able. God has given us a magnificent place to go that we can have places to live in and places to do this that we did not even have to make with our own hand. The Lord was sending the leaders to help bring back the vision so that their vision, along with Moses' vision, that the Lord was given, given the people concerning the promised land could stir some enthusiasm and some positive e excitement in the minds of the people and at the same time give God some praise. It was to develop some good anticipation. It was to charge the leaders, the leaders were charged to go and evaluate the land. We see that between verses 17 and 20. And again, due to our time this morning, I won't try to read all these verses because there's some other verses that we want to get to and look at in a little bit more detail. But please read this chapter for yourself. Between verses 17 and 20, uh, the instruction and the charge is given to the leaders to go and evaluate the land, to go and evaluate the land. They were to evaluate the land. They were to bring back the report, whether it was strong or whether it was weak. Uh, uh, what the, whether there were cities and, and whether they were strongholds and, and the good things that were in it and to, they were to bring back some fruit to show what type of fruit and development and things that was going on in the land. They were to bring back some fruit. We see that in verse 20. They were to bring back some fruit so the people could see what kind of land that God was getting ready to give them. It took them 40 days to search out the land. We see that between verses 21 and 25. It took them 40 days to search out the land. But then here comes the situation. Point number one, they didn't realize that, and for some reason it escaped 10 out of, the, out of the 12's mind, it escaped their mind who sent them to spy out the land. For a minute now, they are forgetting, getting anxious and confused, letting the flesh be the governor rather than their spiritual mind realizing that where God has brought them from, he's also able to take them through, through, too. And brothers and sisters, you and I are not living in Israel's day, days. We're living in a day of dispensation of grace. We're living in a day of the New Testament. We're living in a day of the church. But you and I can make the same mistake that these ten make. 
that sometimes when God gives us instruction and sometimes when he gives us promise and sometimes when he sets a vision before us, we'll start to ask him all other kind of questions. Well, how are we going to do this and how are we going to do that? And we can't do this because it's too big. We can't do that because it costs too much. In other words, just like these people, we will take our minds off God and start putting them on ourselves. So point number one that we need to realize, God is bigger than our greatest fears. God is bigger than our greatest fear. The report of the leaders of the spies comes back in verses 26 uh, and and, uh, 29. And let me just read a little bit of it uh, for you once again, starting at verse 26. And they went and came to Moses and Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel and to the wilderness of Paran and Kadesh and brought back a word unto them and unto the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, We come unto the land where thou sent us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey, and, uh, and this is the fruit of it. Nevertheless, the people be strong and dwell in the land. And the cities are walled up and are very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there. In other words, what they're doing is say, yep, what you, what you sent us to is a great place. Yep, what we saw is magnificent. Yep, what we saw of the land of the fruit is, is, is tremendous. Yep, it's a place that flow with milk and honey, just like God said. But there's giants in the land. But there's walled, walled cities in the land. Verse 29 goes on to say, And the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, and the Hittites, and the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. And, and the people were starting to get riled up behind of this because, because uh, 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 the, the, the 10 that went, 10 of the 12, we're putting a butt behind the very positive thing that God and Moses sent, the, sent them out to take a look at. Now, I want you to understand something that really, to tell you the truth, when it comes down to it, all 12 of them had a butt in their report. All 12 of them had a butt in, our, in their report. The 10 said, yes, the, the land is flowing with milk and honey. Yes, there's a great fruit. Yes, it's a blessed land. Yes, it's tremendous. Yes, it's just like what we expected. Yes, uh, uh, it, uh, to all these glorious and wonderful things, but the, 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 the Amalekites are in the land, but the Hittites and the Jebusites are in the land, but the Amorites are in the lands and they live in the mountains, but the Canaanites are in the land uh, and dwell by Jordan. But these things are a hindrance, and because we saw them and saw the magnificence of it, the land is so big and so vast, along with these giants, it swallows up the inhabitants. Moses, we can't do this. We are like, it, it causes us to look like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and if we look like grasshoppers in our own eyes, we know we've got to look like grasshoppers in their eyes. Take a look to the point once again, brothers and sisters. God is bigger than our greatest fears. But I told you that all 12 of them had a but in their report. The two said, yes, they're right. The land is flowing with milk and honey. The land does have magnificent fruit. The land is vast, and the land is tremendous. But, but, but our but is, is, is this. It's not too big that we can't have it. It's not too big that we can't do what God has told us to do. It's not too big that we can't possess it. In other words, it, it's not too big to stop us. It's not too big to defeat us. It's not too big because God is the one that we serve, and the God we serve is bigger than the problem that we have in the land. He's bigger than they are. He's able to keep his promise. Therefore, let us go now. Let us go right now. Let us go right, and, and I'm going to put it in our term. Let us go right now. In other words, let us go right at this very moment. Let us not spend another minute sitting here in debate. Let's pack up and let's get ready to go. Because the longer we wait, the more, the more like, likely we'll be to disobey what God has called us to do. The longer we wait, the harder it's going to be. The longer we wait, the more prone we are, we're going to be to, to find a reason not to do what God has called us to do. Well, that brings us to point number two. God is bigger than, 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 uh, than what our threats are. God is bigger than our threats. Now, I won't turn to the, to the Israel here in this passage right now because, as I told you, 
the spies were not threatened by the inhabitants of the land. The spies didn't, the, the inhabitants of the land didn't know the spies were coming, so they weren't planning to attack them. They weren't planning to surround them. They weren't planning to do anything to them. They were in the land, and the people that indwelled it didn't even know they were there. So why do you say, Brother Pastor, that God is bigger than what we are threatened with? Well, I have to jump up to Daniel chapter 3, verses uh, 16 through 18, to show you what I'm talking about. Because you remember the story of the three Hebrew boys. You remember that King Nebuchadnezzar built a, a, a very tall stature, a golden stature, and gave a command to the people that every time you hear the music play, you are to, you are to stop what you're doing, you're to bow down, and, you're, and to worship this golden image. And the Bible says that there were three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that when the music played, everybody else bowed down. Everybody kneeled down prostrate to the ground. Everybody bowed down to the golden image. Everybody bowed down to the king's order. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stood tall and stood straight. In other words, in other words, they are saying in their mind, what I see is big, but it's not big enough. Yes, I know you threatened me to put me in the fiery furnace, but that furnace and the fire, even though you heat it up seven times more, that's not enough. When the pressure is enormous on us, brothers and sisters, what we ought to say to the pressure is, yes, you're pressing, and yes, you can hinder me sometimes, but even though you're pressuring me, you're not big enough. The price that sometimes we have to pay might be huge, but no matter how huge that price is, it pales in comparison to the God that we serve, because God that we serve is able. Look at what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, but the God that we serve is is bigger. The God that we serve is able. The God that we serve is faithful. The God that we serve will deliver us. We know that he's able to deliver us, but even if he don't deliver us, uh, O king, let this be known unto you. We will not bow down to this golden image. In other words, what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was letting King Nebuchadnezzar know is our God is bigger than anything you can set up. Well, that brings us to point number three. God is bigger than the doubts that we have. In Genesis chapter 18, the angels show up, and they have a communication with Abraham. They're on their way down to Sodom and Gomorrah because the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah has come up before the throne of God. The Lord is among the three, so the Lord shows up and talks to Abraham himself. There's two angels from heaven that he brings with them. But before they leave the conversation, before they leave Abraham, they turn around, the Lord turns around and gives Abraham a promise and Sarah a promise and said, a year from now, you're going to have a son. Hey, Sarah is inside the tent. Listen to the Lord speak to Abraham. And Abraham and Sarah are now well past childbearing years. They're old and their bodies are feeble, just like some of us right now. Their bodies are old and they're feeble, not producing anymore. And Sarah begins to laugh. And the angel says, why? Did Sarah laugh? And then she turns around and says, oh, but I did not laugh. But yes, they laughed because they figured that the, the, the promise that, that was being given to them was too big for them to provide. The promise that was given to them was too big for them to produce. The promise that was being given to them was too much for them to bear. In other words, they didn't realize that God doesn't tell us something. God doesn't give us a promise. God doesn't send us anywhere that he's not willing to go with us and that he does not make a way. In other words, God is bigger than our doubts. But then that brings us to the fourth point, and that is God is bigger than anything we go through. The Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8 through 11, he says, We are troubled on every side, yet not, not, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, cast down, but not destroyed, always bearing about in the body the dying of our Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our bodies. For, our, for, um, for we which live are always delivered up unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal bodies. In other words, all the Apostle Paul is saying, brothers and sisters, is no matter what it is that you're going through, the God that we serve is bigger than anything that you're going through. 
God is bigger than anything anybody wants to put in your way. God is bigger than any stumbling block somebody wants to throw at you. God is bigger than any insults somebody wants to send your way. God is bigger than any makeup lies that somebody wants to put on the wings of the morning to start a rumor about you. The God that you serve is bigger. He's bigger than anything that you go through. Why was Paul saying this? Because Paul had already gone through some things. Paul already knew, but it kept Paul moving forward. Paul did not stop. He did not shrink. He did not back up, but he kept on moving because he knew that God was able because the God that he served was bigger and going to help him overcome all that they did to him. I want you to know this morning that all of us are sitting here this morning. we got a great big problem. You and I have a great big problem. What is that great big problem? That great big problem is called sin because there are all kinds of answers that somebody would give if you ask somebody what is our biggest problem. You would get all kinds of answers from all kinds of people, but it's more than likely nobody would say that our biggest problem is sin. I wonder, though, how many would give the real answer uh, 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 that our biggest problem is really our, uh, uh, the problem that we call ourselves as because of sin. Our biggest problem then, being sin, whether we're saved or whether we're not, can cause us to have a, a communication break and a lack of relationship with Almighty God so that when we break with him, when we're not walking with him, when we don't serve him, when we don't know him, then when trials and tribulation come, then when the storms of life come, then we're shivering like a scared animal. Now we're shivering like a scared animal, locked up in the cage, can't go too far this way, can't go too far that way. That's because we don't realize that there's a God who sits high and looks low and is able to take care of all of our problems. Sin is our biggest problem, not the weather, but sin, not the political system, but sin, not our finances, but sin, not our sicknesses, but sin. Sin is our biggest problem. What well, that brings me to the last point. God's love is bigger than our sin. The psalmist says in Psalms 113, verses 1 through 6, that Reverend, Ashley, uh, Reverend uh, uh, Lewis already read for us this morning. Look at what the psalm says. Praise ye the Lord, or praise the Lord. In other words, praise, O ye servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Bless the name of the Lord from this time forth unto forever. In other words, how many times, how long am I to praise his name from this time forth to, uh, to uh, forevermore? When I get up in the morning, I ought to praise him. When I'm walking through the course of the day, we ought to praise him. Before I close my eyes at night, I ought to praise him. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the Lord's name is worthy to be praised. Why? Because he is bigger than any problem that you've got. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is like unto our God who dwelleth on high? But take a look at verse 6. Because verse 6 reveals something to us. Who humbleth himself and behold the things that are in heaven and in earth. Well, what does that mean? Well, hold on just for a little second because I want to share something with you. Because first of all, the psalmist talks about God sitting high. In other words, we think that when we watch a plane go across the, go across the sky, that plane is high. No, that ain't high. We watch the spaceship go out in space and circle the earth. And we think that that's high. No, that's not high. Just the other day, NASA sat down there, and I watched people giving each other high fives and slapping their hands together because they landed a little robot on Mars. And if I remember right, it's more it's 300 million miles from Earth, and they think they did something. But I want to tell you something. We serve a God who set so high. We serve a God who's got everything in control. We serve a God who's got everything at the, at the point of his fingers. That be, as far as God is concerned, NASA didn't do nothing but walk across the street. They ain't been nowhere because the psalmist says he sets high. He's high above the nation. He's high above the heavens, so high that no one can equal him. No one is compared to him. He is so very high that he has to stoop, the psalmist says. He has a stoop in order to look at the heavens. He has a stoop in order to look down on the earth. And that's what the psalmist says when he talks about it and he humbled himself. The heavens themselves are high above us. 
How much higher is God who has to stoop and see the heaven and stoop to see the earth? But when he says, but he humbles himself, he lets us know that the same God who sits high looks low. And, he, and when he looks low, it means that he humbles himself. And when he humbles himself, that means he gets down. That means he sets himself low. That means he gets low. And we see this in his willingness. Nobody makes him get low. He gets low because he wants to. He gets low because he desires to. He, he gets low because, because he wants to see and take care of that which he has created. In other words, every time a broken heart, uh, uh, every time the broken heart of a barren woman is healed by the joy of motherhood, in other words, every time a woman who's been barren all of a sudden realizes now she's able to bear a child, that's God stooping low. Every time somebody is blessed and, have, and, and, and God gives a miracle to overcome some sickness, to overcome some calamity, that's God stooping low. Every time your way seems to be crooked and God picks your way up like a rope and snaps it and straightens it out, that's God stooping low. In other words, he mends the brokenhearted. He puts joy back in our step. The psalmist is not suggesting that, that this happens every single time, but when it does happen, it's because God stoops down and it's because God makes himself low and provides for the poor and causes the poor to be raised up and set in places that they could never imagine. But every time this happens, it's because God has stooped. Did you know that he stooped for you? Did you know that he stooped for you? In other words, the psalmist emphasizes the high place of the Lord who becomes low and carries, this carries us to the gospel of Jesus Christ. But he divested himself. Jesus divested himself. He took off his royal robe and was wrapped in a, 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 a swaddling clothes and born uh, and, and the babe upon this earth, he humbled himself. He lowered himself. If you want to call it what the psalmist call it, he stooped. He stooped so low that he was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger. He became so very low that he endured the hostility of sinners all around him because the world didn't have anything but sinners in it. I told you sin was our biggest problem. He went to a Roman cross, and there he was crucified, hung up between two thieves for your sins and my sins. But he couldn't do that if he had not stooped and made himself low. But I want to let you know that it was death, which, uh, and, uh, uh, it was death that he came to do. He offered himself to die. Nobody took his life. He offered his life. He gave his life so that you and I would not have to be separated from him any longer. Why did he do it? It is so he could lift those up. He could lift up all we who are sinners so that from the, from the, from the uh, spiritual ash sheet that we were on because we were all dead in sin and shapen in iniquity. He did it so we could have a place somewhere in his kingdom so that when this life is over, we can say with confidence, I've got another building eternal in the heaven, not made by hand. It was so that he could place us uh, and many of other people who don't have a family in his own family so that he could adopt us and own us as his children. Praise God, because he sets high and he looks low. And I want you to know he's bigger than any problem that you and I have. It reminds me of a song that says, Who made the mountains and who made the trees? Who made the rivers that flow to the sea? Who hung the moon in the starry sky? Somebody bigger than you and I. What makes the flower bloom in the spring? Who writes the song that the little birds sing? Who sends the rain when the earth is dry? Somebody bigger than you and I. When I'm weary and filled with despair, who gives me courage to go on from there? Who gives me faith that will never die? Somebody bigger, church, than you and I. What, has, what are you afraid of? What have you got your feelings all in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a confusion about. What is it that you're facing that makes you feel like a grasshopper? I want you to know whatever it is, it might be big, but it's not big enough. You need to remember he's bigger than every disease. He's bigger than every sickness. He's bigger than every trial and tribulation. He's bigger than every kind of problem. He's bigger than every emotional catastrophe. He's bigger than every worry. He's bigger than every mountain. 
He's bigger than every government. He's bigger than every threat. He's bigger than any confu- every confusion. He's even bigger than death because when they took Jesus off the cross and buried him in Joseph's tomb on Friday, early Sunday morning, he rose from the grave with all power and heaven and earth in his hand. In other words, grave had everybody that had ever died, and grave thought it was big. But that Sunday morning, grave found out that somebody is bigger than me, and he rose from the grave with all power and heaven and earth in his hand. Because he's bigger, he is better. And because he's better, we don't need nobody but Jesus. Yes, the, 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 the spies uh, that came back and said, there are giants in the land, but thank God he always has a few that's willing to stand up in his name and say, yes, they're bigger, but let us go now because the God that we serve is bigger than what our eyes can see. Amen, church. Father in heaven. As we come at this moment, thank you so much for these few minutes to share your word. Thank you for the strength and the breath to proclaim it. And we pray that some have been encouraged. We pray that some have been uplifted. But most of all, Lord, we pray that you've been glorified because you're worthy to be praised. Thank you so much for being bigger than anything we can face. Because when we recognize that, Lord, when we don't allow ourselves to get spiritual amnesia, and no matter what comes our way to realize that you're still on the throne, that no matter how high you are, you're able to stoop down and see us. You're able to stoop down and pick us up. You're able to stoop down and dust us off. You're able to stoop down and cause us to go on and run a little while longer. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your provision. Thank you for your protection. Thank you for these thy people, and not only these who are listening to me right now, but your people all over this land, all over this world, who have named the name of Jesus, whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Strengthen us all, Lord, no matter who we are, that the light of Jesus Christ can shine through to your glory, and other saints can be edified, and souls can be saved. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, there might be one here that's been listening to me this morning that does not know Jesus in the part of the sin. I want you to say, I want you to remember, rather, what the Lord said. He said, the day that you hear my voice, harden not your heart. Behold, I stand at the door and I knock. He said, if any man will open up, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. Paul says, for if you willing to confess with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, then you shall be saved. John says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John, uh, Paul writes again in Romans chapter 10, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Jesus says in John 6, And those that come to me, he says, I will in no wise cast out, but I will raise them up at the last day. I want you to know, brother and sister, if you're listening to me this morning and you don't know Jesus and a part of your sin, you're wrestling with some things that only Jesus can help you. You're wrestling with some things that you can never solve by yourself. But there's a God who loves you, who gave his son for you. But the only way that he can help you with all the power he possesses, the only way that he can help you is if you reach out by faith and trust him and take him at his word. And he says if you'll come to him, that he will save your soul. But you say, well, brother, pastor, what do I need to do? You need to recognize what God said about you, and not just you. He said it about all of us, that all of us have sinned and come short of his glory, which means that we need something to take care of our sin. The only thing that can wash away our sin is the blood of Jesus Christ. It's the only thing that can take our sin away. And when we place our faith in him, when we come to him through simple childlike faith, faith to say, yes, Lord, I realize that I've sinned and come short of your glory. I realize that, that my way and my life has not been pleasing before you. But I believe with all my heart that you sent Jesus. And the reason why you sent Jesus was to, 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 shed, to uh, die on the cross, to shed his blood, to take away my sin. I believe that while he died on Friday, that he rose again early from the grave with all power and heaven and earth in his hands. And I believe with all my heart that he is your son. I believe with all my heart that he is God himself. 
I believe with all my heart, as your word says, that right now he sits on the right-hand side of the Father, and one of these days he's going to come back after his church. I want to be in that church, Father. And your word says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm calling, Lord. Save me according to your word. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, if you have not, if you if you stated that, all you've got to do out of a sincere heart, out of a mean heart, don't worry about somebody around you. Don't worry about what people are going to think about you because this is the biggest decision that you will ever make in your life. It's the most important decision that you will ever make in your life. Some of us make decisions about what house to buy, what car to drive, what clothes to buy, and things like that. What we want to eat, those sort of things. All those things are temporary because all those things are going to pass away. But this decision is an eternal decision. It doesn't just affect you now. It will affect you forever. And the only way that you can be saved is through the faith in Jesus Christ. This morning, I believe that Sister Lewis, Hattie Lewis, is going to lead us in our invitational song. Sister Lewis, if you're on and ready, we're ready for the invitational song at this time. We we have heard the joyful song. Jesus says, Jesus says, spread the tidings all around. Jesus says, Jesus says, bear the news to every land. Climb the steeps and cross the ways. All oh, it is a Lord's command, Jesus said, Jesus said, wafted on the rolling tide, Jesus said, Jesus said, tell it to the sinners far and wide, Jesus says, Jesus said, to the utmost. Jesus says, to the utmost, Jesus says, he will pick you up and turn you around. Jesus says, Jesus says, see, above the battle storm, Jesus says, Jesus says, by his death, and in this life, Jesus says, Jesus says, to the utmost, Jesus says, to the utmost, Jesus says, he will pick you up and turn you around. Jesus says, Jesus says. <coughs> Amen. Thank you, Sister Lewis. We certainly appreciate that. Brother and sister, if you are on here and you've listened um, and you are opening your heart and you want to receive Jesus Christ, here's what I would like for you to do. I would like for you to, after we end the service today, I would like for you to call me. My number is 816-509-1247. That's 816-509-1247. And, I like, and when you call, I want to share some scriptures with you. I want to say a word of prayer with you. Give you some words of encouragement to help you start your Christian journey. And, um, but give me that call, 816-509-1247. When you, now, I want you to understand something. When I'm asking you to call, if you're here in the Kansas City area, yes, we'd like to have you as a part of the progressive family. But I'm not talking about church membership in the local congregation. I'm talking about a relationship with Jesus Christ. There's far too many people who've got a, their names on a church roll, but their name is not on heaven's roll. I'm talking about your name being on heaven's roll first, and then you can get with the local congregation that preaches the gospel and teaches God's word. So if you're here and you've just opened your heart and you have a desire to, then give me a call and we'll certainly walk with you through this so that when it's said and done, you don't have to have any doubt any longer and you can recognize, you too can have the confidence in knowing that no matter what comes your way and no, no matter how big it seems, it, um, 
uh, is not big enough when compared to the God that you serve. Amen. So we look forward to that again, brothers and sisters. We want to thank you this morning for your presence and for your participation. Please be careful uh, as you uh, begin a journey out. We thank the Lord for sending warmer temperatures our way. And uh, Tuesday, I think they're talking about it being up in the 60s. That's almost barbecue. That's almost barbecue uh, grilling weather. <clears throat> but uh, so please be careful uh, as you uh, move about. And uh, let's continue to pray one for the other. Please remember the Pattersons and the Flemings and um, Brother Wesley uh, in our prayers in this particular time of bereavement. And certainly remember all those that brought our sick and shut in this. Just before we leave, uh, I'd ask you all to <coughs> excuse me, to be in prayer for a little baby that was, um, when, she, when she got ready for surgery, she would have been about two weeks old, baby Emma. Uh, Eckhoff, I believe, is the last name. Uh, this would have been my wife's great niece, I believe. Um, and um, this little baby had heart surgery here at Children's Mercy Hospital. And I want to thank you for your prayers because, as we understand it thus far, uh, the surgery itself went okay, but the baby still needs to progress in recovering. There's still some things that we need to critically watch uh, and things like that. But thank you brothers and sisters, for your prayers, and not only for this child, but also for others uh, that are among us. Brother Clifford Keeley, who's had some procedures, and, and, and others among us. We all need prayer, whether we're up or down. We all need prayer. So thank you again. Uh, and uh, if we haven't forgotten anything that we needed to announce, don't forget next Sunday is our Black History Program. I will get with the chairman of the committee. We will communicate with you what time and how we're going to work that virtually. And certainly I want to encourage each of you uh, to join on and to view it uh, in your thing because uh, people like to know that the labor that they have put forth is appreciated. And certainly we want to show our committee that uh, as we recognize this time of black history. Hearts and minds are cleared and let us bow our heads. Father in heaven, again, we thank you for giving us these few moments this morning. Thank you for the people that you have calls to sign on. Thank you for your word that's gone forth. We pray, Lord, that it would do just as you said it would, that it would accomplish that which you please. And you know, Lord, what your intent and your purpose is. But we, but we know that among it is the edification of the saints, the salvation of souls, and the glorification of your, glorifying of your name. Thank you for allowing me to be your servant at this time for this purpose under these circumstances. Lead us now, Lord, through this day in the way that you would have us to go. We'll be careful to give your name the praise. <laughs> now, may the grace of God and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide with every true believer here and elsewhere. May we all say together, Amen. <laughs>